Uh, and now, Phil Crowley, who was nominated by President Obama as the United States Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs, served from 2009 to 11. Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Philip Crowley. Uh, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, for the past year as the Bradley Chair uh, at the Penn State Dickinson School of Law, I've been staring at Tom Ridge's portrait, as I, which sits outside the classroom where I have, uh, as a non-lawyer, teaching lawyers about uh, the national security environment of the 21st century. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, your portrait's good. I every once in a while I have to, you know, tip it to make sure it's, it's still in good shape. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to be back with you again after hearing from Ed Rendell and Tom Ridge and John Bolton, I feel like I'm a support act. Um, but uh, uh, just to make sure that there's a, there, you know, there's, there is a bipartisan tenure when I, I you know, I'll, I'll divide my remarks into three sections. But to start off, uh, I, this is my, uh, I was here last year roughly about the same time, and I put my opening remarks in the context of what was then called the Arab Spring, now called the Arab Awakening, but obviously um, you know, a, a dramatic uh, dynamic and shift uh, within uh, the Middle East. Um, obviously, nobody could have predicted uh, what has happened. And, and a year ago, I think we all had so, you know, a, a greater degree of confidence uh, because of the remarkable events that had occurred in Tunisia, Egypt, and were beginning to occur in Libya. You know, tr dramatic change that had occurred in days, weeks, uh, and months. Um, and I think we, we all had then and still do have confidence that no country is immune from the forces of change that have been unleashed in the region, and that includes the country of primary uh, focus today uh, being Iran. That said, uh, I think we are, have a sober understanding that a year later, we do, need, we do see another force at play, uh, the force being one of resistance. Uh, and that has come not only through the armed intervention of, of Libya, which was successful, but obviously uh, took longer than we had expected, you know, because a leader, rather than bowing to the will of his people, decided to turn his weapons against his people. Now, Libya faces enormous challenges going forward, but at least now, the people of Libya, and as we are seeing with the people of Tunisia and Egypt, have, the, have been empowered you know, to choose for themselves who will govern their country and how. Now, we saw a leader in Yemen uh, uh, also resist. But eventually, he was forced to step down. Yemen's transition will be very different, much more incremental, but it will clearly take time and require significant international support. And as we all know, there is a genuine tragedy unfolding uh, in Syria. You know, we are shocked unfortunately probably not surprised by the lengths to which this brutal regime will go to cling to power at any cost. And just this weekend, as we know, the killing and execution of men, women, and children in the village of Hula. Now, as the State Department said yesterday, uh, we, we, we see in this horrible act the impact of Iran, which actually bragged about the technical support it has provided to Syria to be able to resist the clear and compelling will of an ever-expanding segment of the Syrian people. And we also decry the fact that today Assad is able to hold on to power uh, in large part because of the economic, political, and in the case of Russia, uh, you know, even um, military support from countries like Russia and China uh, and others that enable Bashir al-Assad to survive, at least for now. But I continue to believe a year later that it, we, that it is still inevitable, as was said earlier, that real change will come, and real change will come to a country like Iran, uh, where the people will have not only real politics, which actually, as you know, do exist in Iran, but a real choice as well, which does not happen today. Now, 
having left the State Department a year ago, we, we all have an aspiration for a better world, but we have to deal with the world in which we live today. Uh, we all want regime change uh, in Iran, but we have to figure out how to get there, and we have to manage uh, a process to where, to where uh, we open up new possibilities that may inevitably evolve. We don't want to live in a world, uh, or, and people in the region don't want to live in the Middle East that has Iran possessing an actual nuclear weapon. Now, I'd like to tell you that Iran sits at a tipping point. The strength and the salience of the regime and its policies are in decline. Iran is feeling that pressure, but this is the, the, all the process of change is going to take some time uh, to evolve. And that what's, that's what makes the challenge of Camp Ashraf so salient to, uh, to all of us, to see the people of Ashraf who represent a real alternative uh, you know, to the current regime in Iran, that they are able to leave Iraq safely. And ultimately, as much as we will do everything that we can from the United States, ultimately change in Iran, supported by all of us, will have to emerge first and foremost by forces inside Iran. It cannot be imposed, you know, from uh, the outside. Now, we've heard uh, compelling uh, you know, uh, remarks by Governor Rendell and others about the uh, challenging living conditions uh, that we have, and we've talked about the need for deadlines, the needs uh, for actions. Having been the, the one person having worked in the Obama administration, I, I will tell you, and perhaps John Bolton will agree with me, uh, that, that within the State Department today, we have a dogged advocate, an Ambassador Dan Freed. He is one of our nation's distinguished uh, diplomats. Um, he, is a, he, is a, he can be a force of nature. Uh, and I trust Dan that he will work as hard as he can uh, to move this process forward. Uh, you know, Dan ultimately came back and kept on saying over and over again, the real key here is to not only move people from Ashraf to liberty, but the real key is moving them out of Iraq to a safer place. And that is where the process, while it does exist, and that, that is a, a source of, of progress, uh, this process has to be better and this process has to move faster. Uh, we do not literally have uh, any uh, time to waste. Uh, barely 20% of the uh, residents of Camp Ashraf that have moved have been interviewed by, uh, by the UN. This has to get faster and better. And I would say the real deadline that we should continue to press uh, for the United States as, as a leader in this process is to ask the question over and over again, when will the first refugee leave Camp Ashraf, and when will the first refugee arrive here in the United States? <laughs> we can more effectively go to other countries in the world. As Governor Ridge said, where's the rest of the world in this? Uh, we, we are in a much stronger position when we have already opened our door, welcomed the first residents of Camp Ashraf to the United States, and then say to the rest of the world, we are doing our share. Now it's your turn. That's the, that's the day I want to see happen, and that's the key metric as we work on all of the other things, the air conditioners working, and so on and so forth. Ultimately, to have this be a credible, successful process, it can't just be moving from Ashraf to liberty, it's got to be moving from liberty to somewhere safer and better. Thank you very much. <laughs>